Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon, and this is a slightly different opening just because if you didn't catch last week's episode, it was the first part of a very long recording about the word spelling. So this week, we're releasing the second half of that same episode. So there's no big intro. We just launch straight in with our second cocktail of the evening and go on with talking about spelling and the kinds of problems people have and why they might be explainable, sort of. So if you've missed the first half, you might want to go back and listen to that, but you don't have to. And enjoy. Okay, so we're back with our new cocktails, and this is the XYZ cocktail. So we've gone from ABC to XYZ, the full alphabet. And this, we're also using the Differs Guide version. It's slightly different than the original one from the Savoy cocktail book. But it's basically a daiquiri. It's rum and lemon juice, not lime. It's rum and lemon juice and triple sec and in this version, a little bit of sugar syrup and a little bit of Angostura orange and a tiny bit of salt. And it is very tasty. Mm-hmm. It's a classic mm-hmm. type of cocktail. I initially said, oh, well, one of the ABC or XYZ is more interesting than the other, but this is not a bad cocktail. No, the other one's it more interesting. It's more unusual. More unusual, but this is tasty. Yeah, no, it's a good cocktail. Very well balanced. Yeah, and- it's a nicely done cocktail, yeah. And we used a new to us rum, which I think is also part of the tastiness. It's got mm-hmm. some good, mm-hmm. good flavor to it in Angostura rum. And of course, we said X Y Z because that's right. We're Canadian. <laughs> no, because that's right. If we're moving into the peeves section of the yeah. podcast, then I feel quite able <laughs> to just say no. It's because that's right. I mean, I will say the cocktail is kind of an American. Thing? I don't know, but this just particular because they cocktail all is just, well, say it it's wrong. Ah, but you said the original the recipe Savoy. was the Savoy, so that's Harry Craddock. That's British. So X Y Z. He would probably have said X Y Z. Yeah. Anyway, okay. The point there we is, go. It's right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Well, fortified with this, what do you want to talk to us about? Well, let's start with one of the classics. I before E. (laughs) I mean, this one's pretty easily dispensed with, right? Because it's not a rule. No. (laughs) So that's the main problem here is that the I before E except F or C rule. Has more exceptions. It's not actually a rule. Literally has more exceptions than it has words that follow it. It's a mnemonic that was invented in the 19th century. It doesn't reflect any reality about the phonological histories or etymologies of the word. It's just meant to work in many, but not all circumstances. With common words that people have problems with. Yeah. Yeah. And the common formulation of mnemonic isn't complete anyways. You have to say the whole thing for it to even work slightly. So the full form should be something along the lines of I before E, except after C, or when when sounded sounded as A A in neighbor neighbor and way. way. Or the other version is I before E, except after C, when the sound is E, which is less fun to say, but works. And doesn't help by giving you two more words that you can memorize. (laughs) So these fuller forms catch some of the exceptions, but not all, such as sufficient, C-I-E, and plurals of words that end in C-Y, like frequencies. But of course, and this is where your point about it being a mnemonic comes, those are not the words people have trouble spelling. No. Nobody's confused, or not nobody, but in general, things that bother people like are not, whether you say frequencies or sufficients see even though maybe sufficient is a problem for some people but it's not the one i get that's one of my spelling problems Mm. and i'm good at spelling i spell very well but i have as everyone does my spots spots. and the e-i-i-e one is one and i think it really is the fact that there are these rules that has messed me up i think if i had just learned the words individually so you would have preferred the rote, learn by rote method. Well, or just learn by exposure. I mean, mm. why am I a good speller? Not because I've learned how to spell, mm-hmm. 
but because I've read a whole bunch of text. And so I've seen the correct spellings, air quotes or not, a lot. Mm -hmm. But with words like receive and there, dealing and stuff like that, I know there's an EI issue. And right. so I have become incapable of remembering which way it goes because I know there's an issue. And that I think has actually blocked me. If no one had ever told me there was a problem with EIs mm. and IEs, I think I would have just learned them and not worried about it. Okay. But what about, so the other place it doesn't work is with words like C's where EI is pronounced E, not A. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, the underlying problem here is that number of different vowel sounds are represented by these two letter combinations, vowel sounds that changed in different ways over time and came from a number of different source languages. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with the fact that we're getting a lot of input and there's no reason that they should be consistent with each other. Which is probably why sufficient, for instance, doesn't bother me because mm -hmm. I know where that comes from. Mm -hmm. I know where that word comes from and I know what the underlying spelling is in Latin there. Yeah. So I'm not going to, I have no exactly. problems with that. Exactly. You're helped by knowing Latin. Yeah. And whether that's conscious or unconscious, mm -hmm. it isn't a problem to me. Whereas receive, even though that does come from Latin, the EI part is later. Mm -hmm. That's a French problem. There's no I in the Latin. Right. So it doesn't help me. And um, French messed it all up. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Which is going to, I suspect we're going to come back to that particular problem more than once. A lot of problems, <laughs> yes, have to do with the French. It is true. So, you know, vowel sounds, as I said, that changed in different ways over time, came from a number of different source languages. And this is in part a function of the English language having contained over its long history, far more distinct vowel sounds than the vowel letters to represent them mm -hmm. so that the same couple of vowel combinations were introduced again and again in different eras, different times, different to contexts different to, to, yeah, to, to handle all these different sounds. And then we went and changed all our As they changed. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, the word eight comes from Old English achta or achta, which was spelled either E-A-H-T-E or ash, that's that A-E ligature, H-T-A. Meaning A-E written together. A-E rammed A -E. together. And that became echta in Middle English, spelled E-H-T-E. -E. Nice and straightforward. Mm. Look at how simple that is. And then, But then it became diphthongized to eight as... In our vowels changed. Our vowels changed. We produced all these diphthongs, these vowel sounds that have actually two different vowel sounds in them. Merged without a glottal stop. Mm -hmm. And then later in Middle English, that would be spelled E-I-G-H-T-E, -E, representing that, that diphthong. Sound, yeah. Followed, I mean, no. though, at that point, followed by a guttural sound. So, yeah. echte. Echte. Um, echte. Echte, which was then dropped to leave us with the modern English E-I-G-H-T. Which, though people complain about the, the inconsistency of, is not actually a word that at least people who grew up speaking English have any problem spelling because they've seen it six bazillion times yeah. since they were small. So Easy enough we with all the know, common like, words. Yeah, we don't, nobody spells mm -hmm. that I-E and gets confused. No. Except for maybe young children. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. young children are, are very new learners of English, mm -hmm. of course. But, but, you know, in general, it becomes pretty easy to, to mm -hmm. memorize, but it then doesn't help us figure out other EIs that don't get pronounced that way. Mm -hmm. So the commonly cited exceptions in that mnemonic, neighbor and way, follow oh, a similar same. path to eight. A number of words with EI and IE spellings come from Old French, ultimately from Latin, with a number of different vowel sounds. So Latin vena spelled V-E-N-A with an E mm -hmm. in that vowel position, becomes Old French Veine, spelled V-E-I-N-E, -E, and therefore English Vein, V-E-I-N, mm -hmm. with the A pronunciation. While Latin Brevis becomes Bref in Old French and Modern English Brief. Because of the vowel shift, mm -hmm. right? The E, the long E becoming an E. Brave becoming, becoming E. Yeah. 
which is counterintuitive that the word for brief would have a long E, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> oh. And then being, re that's one of the ones where they respelled it I-E instead of E-E, -E, which would have been much, much easier. easier. Yeah. <laughs> People were taking different tactics. Yeah. yeah. Another example, Latin de Kippera, which is a prefix form of capera. So already you've got that weird. But that happens all the time. But that was yeah. already there in Latin. And that becomes Old French decevoir, spelled D-E-C-E-V-O-I-R. And then English deceive with an E pronunciation. Really, the big problem is the people who wrote the E with an E-I instead of E-E. Yes. Because at the very same time, other people were writing it with an E-E. And the E-E is unambiguous and simple. Mm -hmm. So those are the people we have to go back in our time machine. <laughs> and shoot. And persuade Damn to you. change their mind. All right, fine. <laughs> also, there's Latin licera, which becomes Old French and Middle English lesir, L-E-I-S-I-R, and Modern English leisure. Or the leisure. Leisure or leisure. And there, there we got two different possible pronunciations, mm -hmm. but either way spelled with E-I. Mm -hmm. Latin sufficiens with two distinct vowel sounds, defic E-ens, mm -hmm. right? Spelled I-E. And then as it goes from Old French to Modern English, we get sufficient with mm -hmm. one vowel sound there, but still spelled I-E. Mm-hmm. And finally, the Latin verb forus, which produced the medieval Latin adjective foraneus, which becomes Old French forain, F-O-R-A-I-N, and has a number of Middle English spellings such as F-E-R-R-E-N, F-O-R-A-N, F-O-E-Y-N-E, before settling down as modern English foreign, spelled with E-I. And, and a G for and fun. And a G, yes. Foreign with a, <laughs> with a random G. Yeah. You know what you haven't done? Explain the French? Helped. <laughs> <laughs> because what you've just said is, there's a whole bunch of things, and in, each case, <laughs> and in each case, people made a different decision about how to represent that letter. Which just gets us back to, there's no consistency in the spelling. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that one's an irrecoverable one, to be honest. And that still doesn't cover it all. No, there's more. I know. So, as one joke version of the saying goes, I before E, except after C, and when sounding like A as a neighbor and way, and all throughout August and the month of May, you'll always be wrong no matter what you say. <laughs> But the point is, it's not what you say, it's what you write. <laughs> you can all say them. I have no problem saying the word receive. But to this moment in time, I don't know which way it's spelled. <laughs> you have to admit, foreign is a baffling one. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that, but that I never have a problem writing foreign. Mm. And then there's rain. Mm. And I, I imagine rain may have affected foreign. Like, mm. you know, how these things, how one word will affect the way another word is, even mm -hmm. though they're not related, because some people may have seen a connection there. Yeah. And rain has a G for a reason, but foreign does not. Yeah. So, I mean, with this one, I would just say, let's just forget about the I before E yeah. mnemonic. Stop teaching people that rule. It's, it's useless. messed me up completely. Mm -hmm. And if anything learn something about the history of each individual word. But and even that will be It won't really help though, because as yeah. I said, each time you get to a point where you're like, and so they decided to represent this with this particular letter mm -hmm. combination. Another one that sometimes bothers people is, you know, there's a group of words with an O spelling, but with basically a U pronunciation. Right. A short U. <clears throat> a short U. So some, monk, come. And <laughs> mum, depending which one you mum, are mum, and how yeah. you spell it. And in these cases, there used to be in Old English a U spelling. Right. So they've gone away from the logical spelling for them for some reason. Well, there is a reason. No, no, you don't have a good track record yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one that's sort of related to this is words that have an I sound, like busy, but are spelled with, with a, a U. U. Yeah. 
which is also, again, the original spelling in Old English. The U is the original spelling. No, the I spelling. Oh, the I is the original it spelling. It was originally an I. So we, you know, th these are all, these are words that have a spelling that changed from their original. More obvious. More obvious spelling, kept their old pronunciations, but just have this new spelling for some odd reason. Well, there is a reason for it. It's a reason that is no longer useful to us now, but it was useful at the time. <laughs> so it's, it's a case of, of, you know, short-term thinking. But to explain what happened here, I'm going to have to take us back to the Phoenicians <laughs> and look at a number of letters because there is a bit of a domino effect in terms of what's going on. So let's, and believe it or not, I'm going to start with the letter F. Even though we're talking about vowels here. None of you can see the side I am giving him here. <laughs> I know we're talking about vowels, but we're going to start with a consonant. Trust me. This will help, really. It's related. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh -huh. Okay, so the letter F traces its ancestry back to the Phoenician alphabet and a character called Wa. Wa? W-A-W. -W. Oh, I don't know how. As if I'm going to start trying to Phoenicians pronounce things at this point. It. Yes. When you're just talking wow, about wow. how letters don't wow, represent the wow. sound they're supposed to say. Know. This word meant pig in this, you know, early Phoenician okay. language. But it, it had a different sound than more akin to English's W sound as opposed to the F sound. Okay. It looked like it an looks F. looks like an F. So when you say it's an F, it looks like it an F. It looks like an F. But it doesn't say F. It doesn't say F. It's closer to the wow sound as I'm okay. trying to pronounce it. Like, for those of you, and this is a small group of you, for whom this will mean anything and be helpful, like a digamma. That's where it goes. Yeah. So this <laughs> letter was initially barred into Greek, where it came to be called a digamma because the symbol looked like two gamma letters laid on top of each other. Sort of over, like offset, but yeah. yeah. So for those of you who don't know Greek, a gamma looks basically like if you're doing like um, a hangman. hangman yeah. <laughs> it looks like the, the hangman, the gallows. And without the man. Without the man. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, the gallow part. And then if you stack them one on top of the other, it looks sort of like an F when you think about it. Right. Mm. So it pretty much hasn't changed. And in Greek, this was an old letter. It's an old letter. Sound, yeah. It did not survive very long, even in ancient Greek. It certainly wasn't there in later ancient Greek and certainly doesn't survive to modern Greek. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Greek dropped this letter as the sound itself, in fact, disappeared from the language, mm -hmm. the w sound, but not before it was passed on to the Etruscans. So again, a lot of Greek stuff goes to the Etruscans. Very early. Quite yeah, early. And that's the important yeah. point, yeah. And the Etruscans also had that w sound, so it was good for them. And when it came to Latin, the Romans needed a way to represent their f sound. So the f letter or the digamma was reassigned to do that. Right. As for the w sound, well, the letter U did double duty representing both the vowel U sound, U, and the consonant sound, W, since both were very similar and sort of produced very similarly in the mouth, made with the lips rounded. If you sort of, you know, when you're going, ooh, mm -hmm. and you round your lips like that. So th this was fine for Latin because in Latin, those two sounds are easily interchangeable. Um, interchangeable. Yeah. So they had no problem with that. And in fact, if you're making this ooh sound, you may find it difficult to make the ooh sound without ending it off with a W sound. When you say ooh, you're kind of as you exaggerating letters, it there, yeah. but as you release the ooh sound. The only way not to is to be very, very careful to ooh. stop the sound yeah. before you move your mouth at all. So mm -hmm. ooh, and yeah. Now it's important to keep in mind that the Romans wrote the letter U in two ways, as I mentioned. So when inscribing it on stone, they formed it with straight lines like our modern letter V, but when written by pen or stylus, it was curved like our modern letter U. And for ease, this is yeah. just about how, how it's easier to write things. Yeah, it, it was exactly the same letter for them. It made no difference. It was just the way you wrote it is one reason why in modern editions of ancient Latin texts, there are two, con there are three, three <laughs> conventions 
for how you minute. print those plans, <laughs> how you okay. print those letters. Mm -hmm. There is one convention which uses use for all of the vowels and consonants for all of them. Yeah. So it's use all the way through. So weny weedy weeky would be u e n i u i d i u i c i. There's another one which uses v's for all of them. So salvus would be s a l v v s. And then there's the most common, which is the V for V's and U's for U's. But I say most common, but there are some really prominent, important texts that only use the U's, for instance. So you have to be able to kind of handle all of those when you're reading Latin. Yeah. And important to note, Romans didn't have the V sound. No, this is why it's, it, I say V's for V's and U's for U's. That's how we think mm. about them. So salvus was salvus. So as you say, Julius Caesar, I mean, mm -hmm. Julius Kaiser said. said Wainy, weedy, weeky. And he said it with great gravitas. <laughs> and he made everybody think what a wonderful weir he was, man. And how much weirtus he had, how much virtue he had. <laughs> yes. I still remember my undergraduate Latin prof. He trying was, to convince you that it sounded okay to say it like that? No, no, quite the opposite. Because he, he preferred just pronouncing them as Vs. And oh. he said, you can't say weeny, weedy, weeky. <laughs> but of course you can. You can. Of course you can. Our understanding of what, <laughs> what sounds make what, you know, have what connotations is entirely cultural. Yes. Almost entirely cultural. There are a few things that probably are cross-cultural, but very, very <laughs> few. Anyway, he didn't say it. He wrote it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> So when the letters F and U came into Old English, a few modifications happened. So first of all, the F had to represent two sounds, both the F sound, which it did in Latin, the F sound, and the V sound, which Old English did have. But Latin had not. But Latin had not. Until now, later. <laughs> until later. Now, these two sounds are another pair of voiced, unvoiced sounds that are otherwise articulated in exactly the same way, placing your upper teeth on your lower lip and blowing air through what's called a labiodental fricative. <laughs> when he says what's called, not that many people <laughs> call it that, but those as does yes. <laughs> do. So you have the voiced labiodental fricative, v, and the unvoiced labiodental fricative f. So this was not a problem in Old English since the phonetic environment determined which sound to make. Okay, right. So that's why they could use the f for That's both. why they could use the same letter for both. And you phonetic know, environment meaning what letters and sounds are on either side of them. You don't necessarily have to yeah. explain that. But. So we can still see this in modern English today although we spell it differently, but we can see this, this fact, sort of pattern. this pattern wife, with wives. wife, wives, wolf, wolves. We spell them differently to indicate that, but that's why we have that, that weird spelling. So there explains mm -hmm. another weird spelling thing. Mm -hmm. Why do you change the consonant or why does the sound change? Well, that's because in old English, it was always predictable which way it should be pronounced depending on what sounds come next to it. Mm -hmm. So easy. you could use an F in both cases and because there's no, there's no possibility of having wife's. Yeah. That's not a possible it's word. It's not a possible sound that yeah. they would, they would just pronounce it wives. Or wolf's. Or wolf's. Yeah. Which is weird because in modern English, we can wolf something down. So he wolfs it down. Yeah, that's true. But that's a much later. Yeah. No, I, I understand that, but it's just, yeah, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we, we have, we have developed the ability to have. But it is now a minimal pair. Yeah. For us, we need to distinguish between. F and, and, F and in many other contexts as yeah. well, I know. But, mm -hmm. yeah. And we still see traces of the letter F making the V sound in modern English even. So if you ever wondered why of isn't spelled O-V. Which you probably haven't. Because even though that's weird, <laughs> of should be U-V in fact. Yeah. Uh, UV, that's true. And yet nobody, of nobody UV. has ever complained about that because <laughs> we use it so much that yeah. it has never even crossed our mind. The other one like that is one. 
the letter. We'll one. get back to that. <laughs> Nobody's ever complained about it, or not recently anyway, because nobody even notices how bizarre it Except is. Except children. I think children yeah, have yeah. trouble with that one. But but yeah, so that's why of is spelled of F, even though that F does not make an F sound. We don't mm-hmm. say off. Well, off, we don't say off. We say off, off, we say off but we, we spell it. it you know, with, with two, two Fs, Fs there. To make sure. yeah. So that's a, a holdover from the Old English Spelling Convention. As for the letter U, initially it was also used in English to make both the vowel and consonant sounds as in Latin. And in post-classical Latin, there eventually rose a convention of writing two U's, U-U, in a row, which is obviously a practice that eventually led to the letter W, if you yeah, think about you it. Yeah, when you say, sorry, just to remind people... When you say they used the letter U for the vowel and the consonant, they used it for the vowel U and the consonant W, W, just as we said, we've got away from that. So I just want to remind people. And so, yeah. So So then they started using two U's to be a W. A double U, Mm -hmm. as we call it. Now written with the pointed form of the letter, because remember U and V were the same thing. And I mean, sometimes it, it depends on the font. Yes. There's lots of W's. That look like two U's, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. I mean, when I write a W, mm-hmm. I write it, I, we, a, a small W in handwriting is, to, is, in, to, yeah. is rounded, but a capital is, is V's. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we, we are completely inconsistent about that. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, in many cases, it looks more like a double V. And in fact, that is what the letter is called in French, double V. And, and many other languages. And many other languages. Yeah. But before these two U's were joined together into a new spelling, the two U convention could lead to some cumbersome spellings, such as the Old English spelling of the word wolf, which would if you think about it, involve three U's in a row, U, 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 L, F. So the Anglo-Saxon scribes didn't like that. And soon they developed a new solution to the problem by adding one of those Germanic runic characters. So we mentioned two before, but here's another one, another runic character that was borrowed into the Old English alphabet. It was called Win, and it made the W sound in the runic alphabet. So you only had to represent the vowel sound once they borrowed that into when they the could writing use system. The win for the they used the win for the consonant and the U for the vowel and everything was good. Till the Normans. <laughs> now in, in a later spelling shift that doesn't indicate a change in pronunciation, but just a scribal convenience, since the Norman scribes didn't like those runic characters, they dumped the win and went back to the UU digraph, they thus were faced with the same problem again, made even harder to read by the vertical strokes that were identical to two letter I's. So this this is is the Gothic script. And this is really hard to do in an audio medium. But basically a lot of letters were made by just writing a downstroke, a downstroke, Mm -hmm. right? When you think about it, like sometimes in a long string of letters, distinguishing between an M and an N is kind of difficult, right? Yeah, and you really have to go Google Gothic script and yeah. minims and Google the word minim in <laughs> Gothic script and you will see it is basically, they're all, nuts. they're all downstrokes with a little tick at the top and a little tick at the bottom and you just put them together and whether they're technically joined up or slightly separated is whether it's an M or an I or an and N, sometimes and, it doesn't indicate because, anything just because they were writing fast yeah, and no one Yeah, because of cared. course it's very hard. Yeah. And so you can, you just get these like lines and lines and lines in a row of, of just and it's little downstrokes. Unless you already know what the word is, it's essentially illegible. Yeah. And so, yeah. So the letter U was made with two of these minims, as they're called, these little downstrokes. Indeed, many letters, as, as we said, were made with minims, such as N and N. M, making for very confusing manuscripts, as we said. So to avoid the problem, Norman scribes would often change the letter U in English words to the letter O. Because it looked different. It looked like it a circle. It was actually a circle. It was a circle. Instead of one of these stupid lines that all look the same. And so by way of that whole circuitous path, that's why we've got wolf and monk and, and those, all of those words. Mm-hmm. So, so the 
U becomes an O when it's next to a letter that looks looks like a U when that has a bunch of minutes. Gothic script. Yeah, that has a bunch and of minutes. And since we don't write in Gothic script mm-hmm. anymore, that won't help you at all. No. But if you remember that if it's next to an M or an N or a W, especially if it's next to both, yeah. like the monk, monk. is yeah. one really you does understand M that one. And an N and on either side. Yeah. <laughs> that that is where you're yeah. more likely to have this transformation from a U to an O. So it was super helpful at the time. It makes no, no it is not in it's any no, way helpful. No now. Else, not at all useful now. But at the time it was a really good idea. <laughs> Short term thinking. So wolf spelled with the letter O, the same goes for sum with an M following, yeah. which in Old English was S-U-M. Monk from Old English Munuk. Which would be even worse. <laughs> you just have a whole bunch of minims <laughs> followed by a C. So how many minims do you have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine little downstrokes and a C. Yeah. What word is that? <laughs> no idea. And come, kuman. So again, followed by an M, bunch of minims. Now, not all U's were changed, of course. It was only when it was causing difficulties because of the minimum confusion. Hence my rule of think about what the letters on either side are. And that's why there's O's and U's having the same sound. So Old English full, still spelled with a U, no problem there. Mm -hmm. Uh, They they just left that as it was and we get modern English full. And of course there are some inconsistencies. So uh, it turns out to be kind of useful, I guess. But Old English sunu, becomes modern English sun with an O, but Old English sunnu becomes sun with a U. Because there was one more N, and so they just were, they gave up and turned it into an Well, they left it as a U for ironically. You'd think that would be the one that they changed to an O. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. (laughs) So, yeah. So there it is. Now, something even more complex happened with the word busy. So just for this one word, we're going to go on a bit of a tangent here. Oh, God forbid we go on a tangent in this two and a half hour long episode about the word spelling. This epic about spelling. And again, we'll have to go back to the Phoenicians. I'm sorry. And in fact, that same letter wa, because the Greeks actually got two letters from that wa, the digamma, as we said, making the consonant W sound and the upsilon for their E sound. So here's that E, E, which is a rounded front vowel that's made as if you were making an E sound. And uh, tried to say U whilst doing that. But rounding your lips as if you were making an O sound. Mm-hmm. E. Anyone who speaks French knows how to do it. Anyone who speaks German, German? kind of knows how to do it. With the, that's the umlaut. And I'm sure there's many other languages that have that sound. Uh-huh. But if if those are a language you have and it's the letter it's the way we were told we should have been pronouncing the y i know you'll get to this in greek yes though most people who are like me and bad at pronouncing ancient greek (laughs) just pronounce it like y yeah even though i can make that sound it's Mm. not a problem making the sound because i can say it in english give us your best i mean there you go well, as a as a brief aside, the letter was originally just called U or U, I suppose, in Greek, but this was later expanded to Upsilon, meaning simple or naked U, mm-hmm. to distinguish it from similar sounding digraphs in Greek. So it was only spelt with one letter as opposed to two letters like making an O-U. that sound. Like an O U. Yeah. Or an EU. Actually, EU, EU is very yeah, common in, yeah, in, right. Greek, in Greek. Yeah. Like, like eulogy. So this letter later passed into Etruscan, as so many letters did, and from there into the Roman alphabet, by which point the character looked variously like a U or a V, as we've seen, right? The sound it represented was also slightly different. Latin didn't have that rounded front vowel, So the letter referred to the U sound, but as the Romans began to borrow Greek vocabulary, they found they needed a letter to represent that Greek upsilon sound. So they simply re-borrowed the letter in the form it had in Athenian Greek at that time, which was where we got the Y letter from. Do you know how old I was 
and how recently it is that I realized that the French letter Y <laughs> was just Greek U. Yeah. Or Greek I. Greek, Greek I. I. Yeah. Y. <laughs> You're always like, you anticipate me by exactly one <laughs> sentence. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to be involved. <laughs> but I mean, like, it's genuinely baffling to me that okay, I Okay, but did you know about Upsilon? No, well, I, I do, but only because people have told me about it. Yes, naked you. Naked you, yeah. Smooth you is another way I've heard yeah. it talked about. But yeah. But the, the Y just like genuinely. I mean, I grew yeah. up speaking French from the very. But you just ran it together it, like a well, word. Well, it's just yeah. Y. Right? So did I. Like, yeah. I mean, it's A, A, B, C, D, or F, G, H, E, J. You know, like yeah. you do the alphabet, mm -hmm. you get to Y. I mean, like W. I mean, how, well, but, that well, but no, but even in English, one. but even or in English, w, yeah. w, I mean, how many people have said W their whole life and not realized and never a, stopped because me. it doesn't look like a U. Well, and you also don't write it out. Yeah. Well, you don't write out the word W, mm -hmm. you write out a W, <laughs> you say W. Yeah. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't look like a W, well, it looks like a double V. Yeah. But I, I, but I also just think like nobody ever writes the name for it out. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't, if you were confronted with the word double mm U, -hmm. which you'd have to spell as two, you couldn't put the U on the end of W, you'd have to put it as a separate letter. Like once you tried to spell out the word W, you'd have to realize it was W, but I don't think I've ever done that in my entire life. Right. And Y the same way, like you did never spelled it. So yeah, I was easily in my twenties, maybe my thirties. <laughs> Like, I don't think it was until I, maybe it was Kevin Stroud's, le like, I, it, like really shockingly late. <laughs> I realized. When did you realize that there was Omega? Omicron and, and Omega, o like five, three years ago, maybe. <laughs> like <laughs> When I pointed it out. Yeah, or somebody else. Did, I mean. Omega, Vega, the o, big O, and, and the o Omicron. Micron. The small, the small. no. Because, I mean, I learned <laughs> freaking ancient Greek. <laughs> And we learned the alphabet. Did any of my teachers ever mention it? No. They probably didn't know. <laughs> we didn't think about it either. Like, I just, I, I point this out merely to say that how, like, convention blinds us to mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you just don't notice stuff. Because why would you? So, I had yeah. so many people, when I tweeted about Omega and Omicron, so many classicists I know. replied well, to that <laughs> saying, mind blown. <laughs> How did I not see I, this? Because that's the one where I have, we, we do write out Omicron and yeah. Omega all the time. Yeah, yeah. And literally all you have to do is put a space between Omicron and Omega and like <laughs> no classicist would ever not see it. Yeah. Right? Like if you just put that space in, a hundred percent of <laughs> classicists would see it. But you don't put the space in. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. That was a good day on Twitter. <laughs> anyway. Please proceed to the sentence that usurped. Usurped. <laughs> well, indeed, the Romans called it e Graica. It's not just, you know, in French. The, the Romans called it that, yeah. too. And yes, obviously, that became... And it was initially only used for words borrowed from Greek. Yes, yes, which is when you are when you learn Latin, you, you mm -hmm. realize that the, the Y is only yeah. there. So Greek it words. had a distinct sound of its own. It was, you know... Presumably, the Roman, the educated Roman, yeah. anyways, knew Greek and, again, and you could pronounce it the right in way. In theory, when you're pronouncing Latin, you should pronounce the Y yeah. more like E than like an E, but mm -hmm. who knows. But eventually, the pronunciation of the letter came to be indistinguishable from the letter I. Mm -hmm. So it was just an E sound. And in medieval Latin, it was sometimes used interchangeably with the letter I especially to deal with that same minim problem. Yeah. You know, because an I gets lost in a bunch oh, of M's and M's. Oh, you it, put a Y in when it instead of an... etymologically there. Right? Yeah. Right. Though they also later on dropped it from a whole bunch of places where there was a Y and Greek replaced words. it yeah. with a, an I because yeah. it made the same sound. So it just was easier. Though I think now mostly they've probably mostly been we, restored. We, we, yeah, because etymological spelling mm -hmm. became a big thing in the 18th century. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for instance, the Latin word in weum, meaning impassable, and that's not a word that comes up very often. I don't think I can't recall ever actually seeing it in the world, but yeah, that's so that's only yeah, minims. It's all, all minims, right? 
But if you stick a Y in there, it makes it vaguely possible to understand. (laughs) And when the alphabet was adapted for Old English, they found the letter Y useful because, like Greek, Old English did have that rounded front vowel. We no longer have it in English, but it did at that time. And here's where we finally get to the word busy, because Old English busy, that Y, is sometimes written with a Y and sometimes written with an I, representing different regional pronunciations. Mm. The I sound was probably the original stem vowel sound, so it was probably busy, but in the late West Saxon dialect, this seems to have become rounded to an U sound, and so busy. Mm -hmm. And as Old English became Middle English, we ended up with the U spelling reflecting that rounded variant found in West Midland and Southern dialects, but the I pronunciation busy from the East Midlands dialect. So a thoroughly confusing business. Ha. (laughs) Ha. That was a long walk for that joke. <laughs> for that, that, was not, that was one joke. Yeah. And one word explained in all of that. Yeah. But you have to, sometimes you have to go deep to explain a weird spelling. Yeah. And, that, and the thing is, fair enough, but also, is there anyone in the world who can't spell busy? Busy. <laughs> well, I had the hardest time, not with busy necessarily, with business? but business. Yeah, yeah. Business, I just could not well, do. Well, that's one of those words where obviously business is busyness. Mm-hmm. But obviously, like, is it obvious? Was it obvious to me as a child? No, it was not obvious to me as a child. The business was busyness. Mm-hmm. And of course, busyness doesn't help because then you want to stick a Y in there. But but if you kind of understand it as busyness and then say, okay, but we don't put Ys in there. When so we, the Y becomes okay, an I. I, that's, like, that's, that's not so hard. Then, but because we don't say busyness, we say business. Mm-hmm. We drop that whole... And once you've got it in your mind that there's an I in there, you want it to to be be where the the I is making the I sound. Well, or also, yeah, and you're just upset because there isn't a syllable. Mm -hmm. There's an I in there, but there's no syllable for that I because we Mm -hmm. say business. Nobody says busyness. Business. Yeah. Like, if you pronounce that I, you're wrong. (laughs) So, yeah. And it's a different word, busyness, which we have recreated with a Y. Yep. Bastards. <laughs> but if you remember that long story that I just told, you will have no problem spelling business going forward. <laughs> Solution to your problem. There you go. Result. So I already said this once, but you know what you haven't done yet? <laughs> Helped. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see if we can do better with the situations in which CH is sometimes pronounced CH, but sometimes pronounced SH. This may be a bit more successful. So for this, again, we're going to have to return to the letter C. So as we heard, the soft C, hard C rule in English came about because that hard K sound represented by the letter C in Latin eventually became a S sound in French when it appeared before front vowels, when the vowels are pronounced with the tongue towards the front of the mouth. But this didn't happen evenly or all at once. So initially, C became palatalized to a CH sound, like a CH sound, when it came before a front vowel. And that's still how it's pronounced in modern Italian, right? So when you see in modern Italian a C followed by the letter E or I, it's pronounced CH. Like ciao. Exactly. In French, that CH sound continued to change. So it stopped in Italian, but in French it kept going in that sort of trajectory, becoming a S sound, like an S sound, leading to our soft C, hard C rule in English. But there were other situations in which that Latin K sound changed into a CH sound in French and stayed that way. As for instance, when coming before the back vowel, ah. So Latin cantare became Old French chanter or chante, and eventually English chant. Old English, by the way, had undergone a similar palatalization 
So this is what this is called when a k becomes a ch. So their letter C could represent both the k sound and the ch sound, as in the word chicken, in which it does both. In Old English, it's spelled C-I-C-E-N. But the Norman scribes respelled that second sound with the combination C-H to avoid the confusion, as they were already using the C-H spelling to represent the ch sound, because it was in French. The C-H digraph, by the way, was invented by the Romans to represent a kind of different sound, a Greek sound, again, that didn't exist in Latin. So in Eastern dialects of Greece, the letter chai, how would you pronounce it? Yeah, chai. Chai. I mean, that's not perfect. I'm not, I don't do that sound perfectly, but it's a, yeah, a ch, an aspirated guttural. Yeah, so originally it, it represented this aspirated K sound, but in Western dialects, it made a x sound, K-S, basically together, like an X. Like a xi? Well, yeah. So, and, and that's what was borrowed into the Etruscan alphabet and eventually into Latin as the letter X, right? So a chi, right, right. which looks like yeah. a letter X, yeah. that's where the letter X comes from. Unlike the xi, which made the letter X sound in other forms of Greek, which yes. doesn't make it into the Roman alphabet. It's a no. fun little curly thing. Yeah. But when the Romans needed to represent that Eastern Greek sound in loan words, since they were already using the X letter, they had to invent a letter combination to represent Greek. K. K. Like Christus, right? Yeah. That, that being one of the ones they really had to use <laughs> for. And we still see that spelling in Greek derived words in English. Character. Yeah. For instance. Which would have been her, like that, that her yeah. sound. Yeah. I'm not doing the best ch sounds. I'm minus two uh, r e. I think mm -hmm. not. <laughs> I look forward to what the transcriptions after will do with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually the ch digraph was used to the new ch sound in French, in early French. And though, as we've seen before, the back vowel a became ch. This was only in the central French dialect, while in Norman it remained as a k, a normal k sound. So English occasionally has pairs of words coming from two different dialects with different pronunciations, such as cattle, with a just straightforward k sound, and chattel, with that ch sound. Both coming through different dialects of French from the same Latin word. And in later French, CH further developed from the CH sound into a SH sound. So whereas French loanwords that entered English in the Middle English period, the CH sound is pronounced CH, in later French borrowings, the CH spelling indicates a SH sound in words like chef. Right. And you're saying chef, of course, chief is the, so you have Chief was borrowed earlier. Chief was borrowed earlier. Chef is later. And you could go back. I'm sure we've got some like captain. Yeah. It comes from the same Latin word. Yeah. So we've captain, chief, chef. Yeah. All from the same Latin word caput, which means head. And then like there's a whole bunch of those. Kevin Stroud has some really, really great, very, very detailed, slow explanation of that particular set of ones. But you can really see that going on. Yeah. So, I mean, to sum it all up, you can tell when a word, well, not only when, but from what dialect a Latin word made it into English through French, depending on whether that original Latin C becomes a K, a CH, or a SH. Yeah. yeah. So it's useful mm -hmm. to, to sort of date a word. As a side note, but kind of related, the hard G, soft G rule follows a similar trajectory. It's basically the same idea. So the hard G sound in Latin palatalized into the J sound before front vowels in French, which we see in French loan words like gesture. The French J sound then continued to evolve in French into its current modern French sound, as in the second G in the French loan word garage, 
unless you pronounce it garage. But that change didn't happen until after the Middle English period, when the when Anglo-Norman French was adding all those words to English. Right. So that ending that we have on tons and tons of English words, the A-G-E ending, mm -hmm. right? Baggage. Yeah. I can't think of another. There's tons of them though, <laughs> like luggage, baggage, and voyage. Yeah. Words like that have, you know, that's from one particular period, period when it's still a j. A voyage is a good one because you've got voyage, but well, this will only make sense to Canadians, but you've got, got voyageur, voyageur, which tells you that that's, I mean, really that's still a French word in English, but yeah, it comes into English much, much later. It comes in the 17th century. After that j becomes a j. Mm -hmm. So although the letter g in French loanwords can represent different sounds, it's again a useful way of telling when words came into English. So magic in Middle English, whereas garage later on. All right, you mentioned the problem of one. Uh huh. So let's deal with one. <laughs> Why is the word spelled O N E pronounced like one W O N? And for all of you who are suddenly realizing that it's pronounced wrong, you're not alone. Again, I don't know that I'd ever thought about that. Maybe since I was like five and learning to spell, but until I started listening to people explaining it, it's like, no, of course it's pronounced one. That's a totally obvious way it's pronounced. That's completely Where's right. Where's the book? Where's but the no, but like, but, but, but it's too, it's too, it's too basic a word for me to notice that it didn't make sense. Why is there an E on the end? Shouldn't it be won <laughs> at the very least? Well, the funny thing about this word is that the spelling actually does make sense. And it, you know, it's the pronunciation that's weird. The spelling is right. The right. pronunciation is weird. I have things I'm going to say, but they're going to anticipate you by a sentence. So I'm not going to say them. <laughs> so there are actually two issues here, the sound of the vowel and the w sound at the beginning. So let's take it back to old English. The old English form is on a N right. from which we get the word an the article, the article, the indefinite article and it's the same word. Now the vowel there is a long ah, so it's on. Right, it's a long A. And typically that corresponds to a modern English long O sound. Because of the great vowel shift. No, well, no. no, this this no, this is before that. This okay. is old English to well, this Middle is old English to modern English pronunciation. But yeah, well, I guess you could say it's it's part of a big vowel it, shift, if not the great vowel shift. Yeah. It is a pattern of yeah. pronunciation changes. So for instance, old English bon becomes modern English bone and old English oak becomes modern English oak. And initially that's the path that old English on took with the spelling O N E making ought to be own, own right? Which uh, it is with, can I do one little anticipation? Uh, only. That was the you're one sentence ahead. Yeah. Perfect. No, I, Good. I, I'm holding myself back from some of these, but yeah. <laughs> right. So, which is where we suddenly realize why one is wrong. If yes. you look at only, then suddenly it all comes tumbling down. <laughs> yeah. So it makes perfect sense if we pronounced it own. And in fact, we see, still see that pronunciation in only, as you say, literally one like. And alone is another example right. of that. Right. right? And lone. Yep. So all, all, own, yeah. one, all one, literally. So there you go. There's where alone comes from, all yeah. one, right? However, in one of the quirks of regional sound changes that occasionally happens, the- Yeah, see, when you have to get to quirks <laughs> of regional sound changes, your explanatory power has completely fallen apart. Well, see, but what I'm saying is the, it's the pronunciation that's wrong. The spelling is fine. We just need to change our pronunciation. <laughs> Yeah, that's gonna happen. We're pronouncing it. We're pronouncing it like Pronunci a bunch of hicks. No, we're pronouncing, pronouncing it all wrong. It, yes, <laughs> we're pronouncing it like a bunch of, you know, hicks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> go back to ain, like they say in Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. So the non-standard pronunciation, <laughs> one, arose in the southwest of England and eventually spread to all of England. In addition to the vowel changing from O to a, uh, this pronunciation developed a back glide before the vowel, that w 
sound. Before the spelling became standardized, there were in fact spellings with W. Both pronunciations seem to have survived until as late as the 17th century. And as late as 1685, the schoolmaster Christopher Cooper called the one pronunciation barbarous in his grammar of the English language. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we're left with the spelling of the once standard form, but the pronunciation of a regional form. Mm -hmm. Which is weird. Which is weird. Yeah, there's yeah. no getting around that. There's no getting around that. And by the way, similar shifts happened with other words too, such as oak and oat, which have regional forms as wuck and what. So oak became wuck. I mean, when you say they have regional forms, do they still? Yeah. Or into relatively into modern times. Into the 20th times. century, let's say. Into yeah. at least the 19th or maybe 20th century. And maybe still, I don't know. But into modern English, into right. what's right. considered modern English. So oak becomes wuck and oat becomes what in this? What's oat as in the, the grain? Oat, the grain. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's not a, a top of the mind enough word for me to be sure what you're talking about. <laughs> but these didn't obviously become the standard, standard pronunciations. Yeah. They remained as regional pronunciations. So maybe in those regions, one isn't the loneliest number. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> On the other hand, if things had gone another way, we could be drinking wuck aged wine and eating what meal for breakfast. I'll give you that one's fine. That's fine. It's just the thing. <laughs> ha! I'll laugh at that one. Ha! -ha. You know, one wouldn't be the loneliest number if it had. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Stop the problem. <laughs> the question is, would what meal taste as good if it was called what meal? And also, what meal would you eat it at? <laughs> I what not what meal okay. to eat it at. The audience needs to know that it is almost one o'clock in the morning now, <laughs> and I may not actually be fully sentient anymore. So <laughs> what do we got still? Well, fortunately, we're down to one last sound change, but it's a biggie. It's a, it's a toughie. And this is all to explain why GH makes the f sound. That's why it's a toughie. <laughs> well it's gonna be rough but go for it so <laughs> i i don't think i can describe in a family friendly video what gesture she just made <laughs> this hasn't been family friendly for at least an hour and a half <laughs> So as I discussed <laughs> earlier, words spelled with G-H generally correspond to Old English words that had a kind of guttural sound in them, often spelled in Old English with an H or sometimes a G. So first of all, it should be noted that there were in fact three different guttural sounds in Old English. I said that there were multiple different ones, but- Can you pronounce them all? Yes, I can. And I will in fact not only pronounce them all, but describe them all. That's not what I asked. I can describe many things I can't pronounce. <laughs> so, namely, the voiced and unvoiced velar fricatives and the unvoiced palatal fricative. Yeah, the Three description's sounds. fine. Okay. I want to hear them. So, the voiced, unvoiced, we've, we've discussed. So, it's either, if it's voiced, it would be a h. If it's unvoiced, it'd be a h. Okay. And the velar fricative is slightly further forward in the in the mouth and sounds like and it's unvoiced sorry the palatal fricative is slightly forward in the mouth the velar is further back the palatal is further forward and it would be more sort of a ra. yeah ra, sorry ra, ra, or ha sorry ha, <laughs> or ra, sorry no unvoiced <laughs> ra. <laughs> Those all just sounded like R's. So you're just failing at all of this. That's what I wanted to hear. That's the fail I wanted on tape. Thank you very much. Proceed. Well, the reality is, you know, if you hear any, I mean, except for the, a very small minority, you hear any Old English scholar pronouncing these various different sounds, they're not very accurate. I bet the Dutch do it better. <laughs> 
they got all the glottals. That's true. So basically, they're all produced with the tongue raised towards the roof of the mouth, towards the back, but not quite touching, so you get that fricative sound. So air is forced through the narrow opening, creating a raspy sound, which no longer exists in most varieties of modern English, though in some, and can still be heard in words like Scots Loch yes. or German Bach. Bach? Bach? And the know. point being, we're bad at those words. Yeah. Because we don't have that sound. Exactly. In Old English, those guttural sounds were spelled one of two ways, as I said, either H or G. When the letter H appeared at the beginning of a word before a vowel, it was pronounced like a normal H sound. Huh. But in other positions, it was pronounced as either a voiceless velar fricative, when the neighboring vowel was towards the back of the mouth, or a voiceless palatal fricative if the neighboring vowel was towards the front of the mouth. After or between back vowels, the letter G was pronounced as that voiced velar fricative. So that's exactly the context in which those sounds happened. After the Old English period, the new Norman scribes decided that using H that way was confusing, and so they adopted that GH letter combination to spell this very Germanic sound that didn't exist in French. But over the course of the Middle English period, that guttural sound began to disappear from the English language. So that's why we have a bunch of words in modern English, like through and though, in which the GH is just silent. It makes no sound at all. Mm -hmm. Some words that didn't originally have that guttural sound, like delight and sprightly, began to be spelled as if they did by way of analogy. So delight was spelled as if it were related to the word light, which is an Old English word that had that GH sound. But delight doesn't actually have any. Delight is not at all related to light. But the fact that it had a C there at one point probably kind of maybe helped because it's from Delictara, yeah. right? So maybe that kind of makes it feel yeah. more but like i mean already in french it, it was are, it, it was being lost, spelled yeah. as delete d-e-l-i-t but when they look so that back, sound was yeah. long yeah. gone that's true but by, by that point so yeah i mean maybe it was a, a maybe that's what helps it stick on who knows well or or maybe it was some attempt at a an etymological spelling but those etymological spellings don't really crop up until the 17th century so right okay but yes as you say delectare to allure delight charm please right. is the original source mm -hmm. also the gh at the beginning of ghost is the result of flemish printers of english books mm -hmm. on the basis of the spelling of their related word, and this spread by analogy to other English words like ghastly and aghast, so that's why I have GHs in those, and in some cases the spelling with the GH can be useful for distinguishing between homonyms such as slay, S-L-E-I-G-H, and slay, S-L-A-Y, so that's an argument for holding on to are weird spellings. And there are a few borrowed words like spaghetti and ghoul in which the GH represents another foreign sound. Mm -hmm. So that GH in spaghetti is a particular Italian sound that we don't have, but it was originally there to represent that and we just borrowed it wholesale. And same same thing with ghoul. The GH there is representing a sound from another language that, that we don't have. But what about words like laugh, rough and cough in which the gh is pronounced f like an f sound well it turns out that there is a kind of connection between consonant sounds produced at the back of the mouth and ones produced with the lips they seem like very different parts of the mouth or you know in terms of the the mechanics the of articulation, articulation yeah. but there is a, a, an important connection now we already saw that a bit with words like old english boga or boga b-o-g-a becoming modern english bow so bow the w is at the front it's at, at the lips but the original g sound was kind in the of back yeah. towards the back and it becomes it, it moves towards the front and it's actually a fairly common sound shift that happens in many languages, such as Latin aqua, meaning water, becoming Romanian apa. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so okay. the qu becomes a p. Mm -hmm. 
Similar shifts can be found in other languages such as Irish, Albanian, Russian, and so forth. Well, what happened in the case of words such as laugh and rough is another example of, of this sound change called labial velar shifts. So labial, the lips, lips, velar, the soft palate. So labial velar shift. So it's really a velar labial. Yeah, I suppose. If you think about it, it should be in that order. So another labial sound we have is usually spelled with an F in English. It's a labiodental fricative made by putting your top teeth against your bottom lip and only partially closing off the passage of air, thus causing friction. As for velar sounds, they're, you know, made at that velum, that soft palate, the soft part at the roof of your mouth towards the back. So originally words like laugh and rough were pronounced in, in Old English as hlachan, H-L-A-H-H-A-N. So all of it at the back. All of it at the back. Hlachan. Mm -hmm. And rough, ruch, at the back. Right. The ch sound. So they had a velar sound, specifically the velar fricative made by partially blocking the air by placing the tongue close to the soft palate. So the sound shift here is from one fricative to another, just move forward in the mouth. But why did the fricative move all the way forward in the mouth to the lips instead of stopping somewhere closer, like further forward on the tongue? Well, there's a good acoustic reason for that. There's a reason that the velar fricative would become a labiodental fricative. Friction in both these sounds is well below 4,000 cycles per second. So here's where we get into the, you know, processing the sound. Whereas for, for instance, the S sound, which is also a fricative, the S sound is produced at 4,000 cycles per second or above. So velar fricatives and labiodental fricatives actually sound more similar, even though articulation wise, they're further away. So they sound similar, though you produce them differently. Yeah. So acoustic similarity accounts for other shifts in fricatives too, such as the th sound in words such as three or through, which is a dental fricative produced by the tongue and teeth, becoming the labiodental fricative in some dialects of English and being so about, pronounced. I was so about, about to jump to in. Yeah. And then I thought, no, I won't. I'll let him do this one. <laughs> free and through. Yeah. So, I'm going, I'm, I'm going through there. Yeah. Or, you know, free pounds or whatever. For, for, yeah. Neither of us can do it because it is not in either of our language, in, in our, our dialects, our dialects. Yeah. but it is absolutely yeah. normal in a whole bunch and also with to with, right? Yeah. Go on with him. Yeah. It, it's very it's London. It's a London character. dialect, but it's also yeah. Black American a dialect and dialects. a bunch of other yeah. dialects, like tons of places. Yeah. Very, very normal in a whole bunch of places. So, yeah. So if you can imagine now that that's a still a front of the mouth to a front of the mouth, the to f, mm. but yeah. But it's still moving forward. Yeah. yeah. Now, in some cases, words that underwent this shift became respelled to more accurately represent the sound, as in the word dwarf, which was in Old English spelled D-W-E-O-R-G. Mm. So dwarf became dwarf. But in other places, they left it. Yeah, they left the spelling, but changed the pronunciation. And in the case of the word draft, sometimes spelled D-R-A-U-G-H-T, but sometimes spelled D-R-A-F-T. That's one of the places that... You see both spellings. Yeah. Yeah. But for the most part, the G-H spellings reflecting that older pronunciation became standardized, and so we're stuck with them. The thing is, the changes in pronunciation didn't happen at the same time in all parts of England, nor in the same way, and what we inherited in modern English is a bit of a mixed bag. So the shift to the f sound was particular to northern dialects, and so we see some Middle English spellings with the letter f in words not pronounced f in modern English, such as thof for though, okay. and thurf for through. Mm, that with the 
with the metathesis of the U R. D D U R. Yeah, and that metathesis was already there in Old English through or thur. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. No, and that's very like. There's a ton, a ton, a ton of words yeah, in English that's very that common. does that. Yeah, and in at least one case, the northern variant persisted, eventually becoming a separate word. Duff, a kind dough. of steamed pudding. Yeah. Yeah. Was originally just the northern pronunciation of the word dough. Duff, right. so dough. figgy duff. Yeah, is not that that's. I mean, that's still a regional word. Duff is not a mm -hmm. common word elsewhere. But and one last little footnote to this is, you know how the word hiccup is I sometimes I spelled G H. <laughs> yes, but that's because they thought it was cough. That's because the false etymological connection with the word cough. Hiccup is not at all related to that. Hiccup was always pronounced with the P sound. And so even when it's spelled with, you know. As if it was hiccup. Hiccup. It is still, should be pronounced hiccup. That one was one which, to be honest, has always confounded me in print. Because mm -hmm. I want to say it as hiccup. And I, I was like, I don't know, maybe maybe some people say that, right? Like it's a weird word that's just an onomatopoeia. Who knows what people say? Yeah. So. <laughs> You're done, right? What are your pet peeves, everyone? <laughs> what are your pronunciation peeves? Yeah. So what are your problems with how things are spelled and how that reflects how people do or do not say them? Would you like us to speak, when I say us, I mean him, <laughs> for another two hours on another night about these things? If so, write in. <laughs> if not, also write in. <laughs> Was there nope. anything that I failed to cover that I should have, you know, I missed the obvious damn bastard spelling? Give it to me. <clears throat> I will attempt to make it less painful. Or just talk about it for a long time. Well, yeah. It could <laughs> just be that. Yeah. So let us know in the comments and we will see if this is one or two episodes when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I have views. But yeah, you know, it's English's fault, really, when you come right down to it. Our it's bastard tongue. Our, our magnificent bastard tongue. Yes. Indeed. And I think that is now time, because I have to get up for work tomorrow, Mark, <laughs> in six hours. So, good night, all. I hope you've enjoyed this incredibly phonetic walk through an incredibly unphonetic spelling system. <laughs> Nice. And we'll be back next month with an episode all about other kinds of peeves. <laughs> <laughs> an interview. Good night. Bye bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.